Praise God. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. It's good to see everybody. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Here we are. We're in August. Isn't it something? We're already here. And uh, praise God. Well, they call it August around here in Alabama. They call them dog days or whatever it is. So we're here. But uh, fall will be right around the corner. Praise God. The, the, war, the, 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 the heat will break. Uh, the humidity will lift. And uh, it'll just be a few weeks here before, too, before you know it. We'll blink our eyes a couple of times and we'll be looking at Thanksgiving. Praise God. And then Christmas. And then we'll start another year. Y'all ready for it? But here's the deal. We still got plenty left this year. You know, the scripture says that God can drip his fatness, his blessings, his goodness upon our year. A year is not just uh, seven months. No, a year is 12 months, right? So we've just completed seven, right? So that means we got five more that God can, can, can do great things in our life. Do we believe that? Uh, let me encourage you this morning. There are scriptures in the Bible where people are just going about their life like they usually do. Because let me say something to you. The scripture tells us that Elijah himself was a man with, such, with like passions as we are. You read that over in the book of James. Okay. Uh, you, you ever heard the saying down here in the south, you know, they put their britches on just like we do? You ever heard that before? That means God's not a respecter of persons. Uh, some of us are made in his image and his likeness. Just a few. Just the apostles. No. No. And do you know that people did life just like we do life? You know, people talk about the good old days. You know, back in the old days. Uh, you know, you know, your parents always talked about that they walked to school uphill both ways. You remember that? <laughs> in the snow, barefooted, all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, listen, uh, th- those kind of, to me, those are not the good old days to me. <laughs> I, uh, I like, it's like Brother Hagin said, he said, I believe in God and air conditioning. Yeah. Amen. So thank God for air conditioning. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, I mean, just, you know what I mean? But here's the deal. People did life. They've always done life. And yet we see in the Bible, here's where I'm getting to. We see in the Bible where all of a sudden, suddenly. Uh, I mean, I mean, one minute it can be a certain way, and the next minute or the next day it can be another way. You know, uh, when you get to Isaac, you know, you got Abraham, Isaac, Jeff, you know, he sowed and reaped in the same year. Why? Because of God's blessing upon him. You know, there, there's, there's uh, uh, scriptures in the Bible where suddenly an angel appeared. An angel showed up. Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 14, that angels are ministering spirits that minister for us, the heirs of salvation. Uh, you know, there was a, a lot of angelic activity at his first coming. There's going to be even more angelic activity before his second coming. You know, the Bible says, look, can I give you some more scriptures here? The Bible says that the children of Israel, which is a type and an example for us to learn from. The Bible says that we're to learn from that. That's what Paul wrote to the church. The Bible tells us, even that the things that God spoke to him promised the land that was theirs, that was flowing with milk and honey, which is really a type of our salvation and the life of the spirit that we have in Christ Jesus now. The Bible says that there was uh, some people that it didn't profit. And the reason it didn't profit them is because they did not mix faith with what was said. In other words, they really, they just, they did life. Just like everybody does life, but they never mixed any faith. In other words, there was no expectation. They just, well, just same old, same old. No. 
not the same old, same old. You know, uh, Sean mentioned at the first of the service, you know, Spirit of God signifying in him and through him just like he did. You remember I said, uh, these people put their britches on just like we do, just like Sean does. And yet, uh, sometimes things can go right over our head. You know, he said at the beginning of the service, this is the day that the Lord has made. And we're not talking about August the 4th. 2019 even though it is included but the day that we're talking about when the bible talks about this is the day that the lord has made he's talking about the day of salvation the day which jesus came do you know the bible tells us that even the prophets even these people that listen we esteem them we honor them because they had a place and God had called these men and women. And, and yet we look at these examples and, and what, a glorious, what a glorious thing to look at and learn from. But listen to me. Uh, Jesus stood before the Pharisees and he said, Abraham rejoiced to see uh, this, this day. I mean, do you know that the people in the Old Covenant, I'm talking about Moses, all of them, they, 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 listen, they're probably, they're in some regards probably in awe uh, and, and not, I say envious, you know, the Bible says not envious, but in one, one way, I think they're a little envious of us. See, we live in a dispensation. We live in a time. We live in a day where the free favors of God profusely abound. You know, they, they, there was people who lived in a day, lived in a day, that if you didn't rest on the Sabbath, you were put to death. If you didn't do the right thing on, 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 on the Sabbath, you didn't, you didn't get to live no more. How'd you like to live in that day? Because those are good old days. So those good old days. You thinking oh, that's just one thing? That's just one thing. Oh, there's many things. No, Jesus has come. The Word became flesh. For God so loved us, He came to us, became flesh, took upon flesh and blood, destroyed the very adversary that is against us. You know, we were singing. He is for us. And who can be against us? It doesn't matter. Um, somebody says, well, the one lady said she, she stood up in a church service. This was years ago. And she said, the devil's been after me all week. Bless his holy name. Oh, no. I mean, she actually did. This was something I remember back in the days of Brother Hagin talked about. A lady stood up and wanted to testify. Of course, a lot of times they get, you know, let people testify. And she stood up. And listen, if you testify, you need to be testified about what God's doing in your life. A lot of people want to get up and testify, but they're just testifying. All they're just telling is what all the problems they've gone through. That's not testifying. If you testify, you testify to the goodness of God. But she stood up and said, well, the devil's been after me all week. Bless his holy name. <laughs> That's pitiful, isn't it? I like the T-shirt that Pastor Buzz used to wear. I saw a picture of it. You know how people do pictures at their services, like at funeral service when I went to his memorial service when he went home to be with Jesus. And, of course, you know, they, they do now, funeral home, they do slides and stuff. You know, they have some music playing in the background, and they'll do all these pictures and stuff. My slide wouldn't get through the first verse of a song because we never do pictures. We'd have to borrow pictures that somebody else took of us because we don't do pictures at our house. Um, and so uh, I'd never make it through the first song or through the first verse of the first song with pictures. It'd be about two pictures, and then that'd be just two pictures. <laughs> but they had a picture of him, and I love it. He had, he's wearing a T-shirt, and I'll never forget this as long as I live. And big, bold letters on that T-shirt, it said, The devil said what? The devil said what? So what? I don't care what he says. Is, oh, he's full of truth, right? 
No, Jesus said he is a liar. He's the father of lies. There is no truth in him. So anything he's telling you or trying to bring to you is just a lie anyway. There's no truth in it. Just ignore it. Chaps him pretty good when you ignore him. He's always trying to get people to yield to him because he has no authority. Jesus has all power and authority in heaven and earth now and when he was raised from the dead. If Jesus has all power and all authority in heaven and in earth, then how much does that leave the devil? If Jesus has all, A-L-L, power and all authority in heaven and in earth, and later on Paul even said even under the earth, how much does that leave him? Zero. The only, tra- only thing he tries to do is bring a lie to us and so that we'll give him or relinquish our authority and dominion that we still have. He has zip. He's a loser. He's done. <laughs> He's done. So, the devil said what? No matter what he said. W- what does God say? You want me to tell you what God says? Can I tell you something that God says? D- do y'all need an offering envelope? If you need one, just raise your hand and they'll get one to you. Let me tell you what God said. This is God's word, right? Is the Bible God talking to you? Somebody says, I want to hear, I want to hear God. I understand what people say when they want to hear God. Uh, they want to hear the Spirit of God on the inside of them. They want to be able to recognize that more clearly. But really, um, God said a lot of things to you. God has said a lot of things to me. So what we need to do is just open the book and find out what God has said to us. We need to first find out what God has said to us here. That in itself will help us recognize more clearly what he's saying to us in our spirit because he'll never say anything that will contradict or violate what's written in that word. Praise the Lord. So let me give you something that God said in Psalm 35, verse 27. You ready for this? Let them shout for joy. Notice it didn't say, let them be quiet with a stiff face, with a, with, a sa- with a sour look. <laughs> let me tell you something. I'm, I'm going to be excited for some people when they get to heaven because they're going to shout more than they've ever shouted down here. I mean, they're li- they will literally shout. Uh, in Father's house, we see, is, and you've heard me say this several times, but I'll say it again because I like to say it, and it needs to be said. When the prodigal son came back to Father's house, which is a type and a shadow of, of God the Father, when he got close to that house, he heard music and dancing. You've heard me say this before. You can hear music, but when you hear dancing... They're, they're cutting a the road. There, there's some noise going on. Listen, guys. People are, listen. I can, listen, I can promise you, people are not just sitting up in heaven. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Do I need to demonstrate? I know, I'm, I know Rita's been, she's been waiting for me to demonstrate some of this. I, I would, it would probably shock y'all. <laughs> it, it would shock you. Uh, I, need to, I need to bring some, guys, we need to bring some video footage probably from some of, if we had some video footage from the other church, it, it would probably flip you out, some of you. You yeah, said, so we've never seen him like that. Well, that's okay. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm all things to all men, just like Paul is. I'm just, I'm messing with y'all. Okay. Let them shout for joy and be glad. He didn't say let them shout for joy and be sad. He's talking to us. That favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say once a week. Let them say every Sunday. Well, no, let them say every Sunday and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. No. It says, let them say continually. Say what? Let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. 
Let me say something to you. If God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, how much more does he take pleasure in his sons and daughters? You know, Jesus said in the upper room, he said, no longer do I call you servants. There's nothing wrong. Paul served God. He was a bond slave to the Lord Jesus Christ of his own will and of his own want to. But Paul knew uh, about sonship because Paul's the one who had the revelation and wrote that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The spirit of adoption now in us cries, Abba, Father. So Paul truly had a revelation of not just being a servant or serving the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew his place and his authority. Now, if God takes pleasure... And wanted people to shout and be glad because he did take pleasure in the prosperity of a servant. How much more does he take pleasure uh, in your prosperity? Matter of fact, when God decided to take on human form in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the first things that came out of his mouth was words like this. Oh, You being earthly parents, evil, carnal, natural, want good things or want to give good things to your children. How much more, much more, much more does your heavenly father want to give good things to his children? So. Got five months left. Can anything good show up in five months? Uh, or can anything good show up today? Can we mix, start mixing faith? Listen, you'll have to stir yourself up. You'll have to stir yourself up. You'll have to edify yourself, encourage yourself. And we'll get into some of this in a few minutes. You'll have to stir yourself up and get yourself... On purpose, to keep your heart and your soul in a a position of receiving. Because the Bible says that God, above all things, above all things, 3 John 2, wants you to prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. Soul prosperity has to be, has to be, Why? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you never mix faith, you never think along a certain line, you don't ever expect good, expect increase, uh, uh, knowing that God wants to bless us and and increase us. The Bible tells us he wants to increase us more and more, us and our children, Psalm 115. But we have to mix faith with that. In other words, we have to praise God and thank him for it. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, I was in a recent service, and one of the things that was mentioned, and we'll move on here. But you know how the Bible says, when nobody encouraged David, David encouraged himself. There will be times in your life, then there, listen, thank God, we, we, we should edify one another. And the Bible says we speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You can speak to yourself personally, or you can speak to yourselves. You can speak among yourselves. We're to love and to encourage and to edify one another. And thank God for that. And there's times that God puts people on your heart, or you just, like you come together in here and you, you see each other, and, you know, we embrace and, and just, as Sean has mentioned over and over many times, just that love that's in you. You have a, you have a treasure in your earthen vessel. God himself lives in you. You know, people sought to touch Jesus. And, and not just touch him, but if they could just touch, the, touch his laundry. Why? Because that stuff got out in his laundry. What do you mean? The anointing, the virtue. It got in his laundry. They just wanted, if they could just touch the hem of his garments. Not just the woman with the issue of blood, but if they could touch him, they would be healed. And many did. Well, listen, Christ is in you now. What is Christ? It's not Jesus' last name. It's the anointed one and his anointing lives in you. You know, it can be released on demand.
I'm not trying to take away from touching the hem of, of, of the garment of Jesus or coming to Jesus. But let me say something to you. You're the body of Christ now on the earth. Um, we need to identify not we're just going to touch his garment, but now uh, be the one where someone can touch your garment. Because you are the body of Christ now. You're the embodiment of the Spirit of God. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives and dwells in you and me. And when you woke up this morning, you may not necessarily felt that by a feeling or an emotion, but nevertheless, it, that anointing abides in you. And John says it, it'll teach you. It'll guide you. We have to stir ourselves up. David encouraged himself, even under an old covenant. And at that time when he did that, uh, the enemy had come in and stole, not just him, but all of his people, his men, stole their, their wives, their children, and all of their finances. How would you like to go home today and everything is gone out of your, 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 your place? You have no money in the bank account, nothing. Everything's gone. Your family's been taken from you. And you're left. And yet because of one man encouraging himself in the Lord. Because of one man. Had such an effect because he encouraged himself in the Lord. That they got their wives back. They got all their kids back. They got all their money back. And they got extra money back from the adversary. But had not one man encouraged himself in the Lord, I would probably submit to you to this day because of one man not encouraging himself, not because somebody else had encouraged him, but because he encouraged himself in the Lord. Had that not have happened, they probably would have never got their wives back. They never got their families back. They, never, they would have never, it, it's over. Now we've got scriptures like this. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Oh, praise the Lord. He takes pleasure. He, do, he, he wants to bless us. Our Heavenly Father wants to bless us more. I can promise you we've not bankrupt heaven yet. You know, people think... And it's just a lack of understanding that, listen, I, listen I'm not, I believe in stewardship. Don't get me wrong. Understand my heart. We should all be stewards. I don't like it when people litter and just throw stuff out at, you know. I've seen people just, I've actually seen people open up in a, in a, in a, in a parking lot, open up their door and throw sacks of, of fast food, sacks of food, cups, everything, and just dump them out and, and then turn around and drive off. Do you like that? No. I don't like that. Okay? But let me say something to you. A lot of people have got this idea that we've got to protect our planet because if we don't, we're gonna, there's not going to be enough. And we're going we're gonna to just destroy everything. No. No. <laughs> there is more than enough. There's more than enough resources. God knew exactly how many people would be here out of his foreknowledge and his wisdom? And I'm telling you right now, he's more than enough. Not just enough, but more than enough. Matter of fact, let me say this. Now, I know these things are coming to me, but I want to say them to you. Because, listen, we need to think this way. We need to hook up with Jesus. Jesus, after he had fed the 5,000, I'm telling you guys, that's pretty supernatural stuff. And that's just, that's just the, listen, that's not counting the women and children. And then he gets on a boat, and they're, they're, about, they're flipping out. And we would have too, I'm sure, if we'd have been there. And yet, he, he sort of says, well, hey, what's, what's, what's the deal with you guys? Do you not remember what just happened? Do you not remember that I just fed several thousand people? And he said, the reason you're so upset is because of the... And then when, when, it's, when, when the wave stopped, they, they, they were astonished, like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. 
And he said, why, why are you astonished? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He said, why are you astonished because something supernatural happened again? He said, do you not remember what just happened? He said, the reason you're astonished is because of the hardness of your heart. Let me say it to you like this. If you get, if you get, if you get flipped out and you marvel over supernatural things coming into your life, that is a sign that you're more sensitive to the natural and to the world and, to the, and then the spiritual. In other words, if something were to show up, I'm talking about showing up supernatural in your life, and these words come out of your mouth, oh, my God. That All that is is just a sign of a, of a hardened heart that, when I say hardened, don't, don't be offended by it. It just means you're more conditioned to natural things around you, and you're less conditioned, and, and you have less expectation about supernatural things. Because that's exactly what Jesus told his disciples. He said, why are you astonished? You're astonished because of the hardness of your heart. Don't you remember what just took place? He said, what you're saying is you're, you're not really, you're not even, it, it flips you out when something supernatural happens. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good this morning. Listen, I'm speaking to all of us. God takes pleasure. And people need to get happy about it. Can, can I give you another quote from a well-known minister that I love and respect until this day? He said, the word of God will really start working in your life. Here's what his, 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 was, this was his terms. He said, the word of God will start working and manifesting in your life more when you get excited about it. He said, you show me somebody that's not excited about a scripture or a promise that God has promised to them. They're not really excited about it. That, that's really no faith. See, there's joy and peace in believing, the scripture says. Not just peace, you're at peace, but there's also joy. Joy is, is not a result of, of something that, uh, that, that's external that's going real well. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit of God on the inside of you. Well, Brother Roger, yeah, but you don't understand. Listen, I don't have to understand. He, he's already understood. <laughs> and he, he, he knows you, the very hairs on your head that's numbered. He loves you. He cares for you. And he's provided for you for all things. He has a plan and a purpose for your life, for you to run your course with joy, to run that race, to finish that race. I'm talking about to the end of your life. And he desires and takes pleasure in blessing you during the whole time. Does that mean you're not going to encounter uh, uh, stuff? No. You remember Paul said, he said, there's many. He said, there's, there's effectual doors. There's, there's great and effectual doors that, that are open to me. What do you mean? To fulfill the plan and purpose that God had on his life. But he said, and here's what he said, but there's many adversaries. But just because there's adversaries, remember our phrase? The devil said, what? It doesn't matter what he says. It doesn't matter what he tries to do. The Bible says if you resist him, what will he do? Is that true or is that a lie? Well, you call his bluff. He's always trying to call your bluff. Just call his bluff. Call his bluff. You know, I, I was listening. To, uh, man. I don't know if I'm going to get my sermon today. But this is okay. I was listening. I was out back in my shop. I've told you this before. I go out and back in my little shop back there, and I do different things. Um, every now and then, I try to do a little exercise back there. I've got some weights and stuff, and, you know, get all buffed up, you know, all that kind of deal. But usually, I go back there, and I'm listening. I, when I do anything like that, I'll, I'll have my phone back there or have me a little wire, wireless uh, uh, Bluetooth speaker, you know. So I was listening to Brother Hagen the other day. <laughs> he was talking, and he says, and he says many a times. He said, "Now this is Texas talk." He said, "Some he's he he was in Rama. He was teaching the students out there at Rama Bible Training Center. And of course, you have students come from all over the world at that time, especially back, and they still do. But I'm talking about when he was teaching and ministering there. People come from everywhere. And uh, he said, you know, he knew that he'd say some." local expressions that some people from other countries didn't understand uh, but he said this he said we have a saying down in texas you know we would dare people 
You know, especially if you grew up in school and somebody dare you. You know, if they dared you, I mean, it's almost like your pride, you know. <laughs> listen, your manhood's put on the test right there, I mean, you know, in front of everybody. And he said, but there, he said, then we'd double dog dare people. He said, if you ever got double dog dared, well, I double dog dare you. And sometimes these things were said in front of other people. And if you're two boys sitting there and there's other, your friends sitting around and, and somebody says, I double dog dare you to put your hand on me. I double dog dare you. Well, you, 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 heck, I mean, you know, I mean, even if you were sort of a little nervous and scared, you'd almost do it just because to save face. Because you were double dog dared. Not just dared. I dare you to do it. I dare you. I dare you. You, st- you step, I dare you to step across that line. You know, when kids on the playground, I dare you to st- you st- draw a line. I dare, I dare you to step across. And then, then, I mean, listen, we raised the ante up when we go, I double dog dare you. He said, he said, that's what I would do the devil. He said, I tell the devil, I dare you to try to put sickness on me. And then he'd say this. He'd say, he'd tell the devil, hey, hey, devil, I double dog dare you to try to put cancer or anything on me. And most of the people would suck the wind out of the room and go, my God, I wouldn't say nothing like that to the devil. He might put sickness on him. Or put sickness on me. If I told the devil, dude, if I dared him, then he may just, you know, he may would do something or try to come against me. Dear God, I'm not going to say that to the devil. You know what that is right there? That is a lack of understanding of righteousness. The devil has zero authority and power. None. Now, yes, there's a curse here in this earth. The earth's fallen, and he will try to come against people. But let me tell you something, folks. No weapon formed against you. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And anything and everything that would rise against you to judge you or to bring something against you, you are to out of your mouth, which is connected to your heart, you condemn that thing. Condemn means you take authority over that thing. Why can you do that? Because the end of that verse says, because your righteousness... Your righteousness is your standing, your, your spiritual position, the place that you're really in. You're standing in a position that God has supplied for you. Your righteousness is of him. Jesus is your righteousness. That's why when you speak that name, it, it's, not, it's not a rabbit's foot. It contains all authority, all power. It's above every name. And we need to stir ourselves up, encourage ourselves in these truths so that when we speak them, like Jesus said to his disciples when he huddled them up and said, come here, boys, let me talk to you just a second. I need to give you a little faith lesson. You need to believe what you say when you say something. And you don't need to doubt when, when you speak something or when you say something out of your mouth. You don't need to doubt what you're saying. If you will believe what is coming out of your mouth, if you will believe what you're saying, not just what I'm saying, but what you're saying, you will have whatever you say. You know, we need to encourage ourselves up in that. I, I have, have done that of late. And one of the things I'm recognizing that has helped me is I'm not just as quick to say something as I used to. It's not that I won't respond, and it's not that I won't share things with people. If somebody asks me a question, I'm just going to sit there and stare at you. No, it's not I'll talk with you. But I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more aware that I need to be mindful of what I say. And then when I do say something, especially if it pertains to things that really matter, concern us, when we're dealing with stuff, then I really want to make sure that what I say, I really believe, I, believe I, what I say will be. And I don't need to doubt that because the Lord himself told me and you that. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. 
And we've talked about that teaching because when you, when you encounter, in context, the first chapter, when you, when you encounter trials and temptations and tests, okay, number one, you need to pray and talk to God about it. When you do, you, can, you need to do it in faith. You don't need to be double-minded about it because you won't receive anything. Number two, you don't need to think it's God that's behind it. Don't let a man say that when he's tempted or tested that it's God. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. That's the context. And then, right after that, he says, Wherefore, you need to be swift to hear and slow to speak. And you don't need to get upset. But wrath means don't get upset because you're going through it. Upset at who? Upset at the Lord. Upset at the preacher. Upset at the Bible. Upset at the promise. Upset at somebody that tries to encourage you. No, we need to say and to speak what God says. Because later on, he says this. He said, listen, a man who is perfect and mature um, will not offend in, in, with, with things coming out of his mouth. And that man that won't offend with his mouth or say things that he don't need to be say, or don't need to say, listen to this, he will be able to bridle his whole body. Do you know what you say out of your mouth can affect your whole body? The Bible says it does. But this is of faith, folks. It's of grace that it might be of faith that the promise might be sure. Aren't you glad a while ago we're not under the law? Like I said, because if we didn't do everything right right on the Sabbath, we'd be dead. Not just that, but other things, we'd be dead. So thank God for his grace and thank God that we, it's no work involved. It's only believe. You remember when the Pharisees came and said, show us the work of God that we can work. Show us what we can do. He said, this is the work of God that you believe. He believeth, he he that believeth hath. He that truly believes has entered into rest. There's joy and peace in believing. Now, listen to me. There's times when that peace is not there and things will come against you. And and there are times when the devil himself will on purpose actually attack you with doubt and fear. It's not just the situation itself that he will come against you specifically. And when I say that, it's because he's not omnipresent like the Holy Spirit is. People think the devil's omnipresent. He's not. He's not God. God is God. But there are times when he will come again. You know, the devil don't attack me every day because he's not omnipresent. He can't attack me at, you know, per se. I'm talking about the devil himself because he's only one spirit. Now, he has demonic spirits that that work with him, but you understand what I'm saying. I remember Wigglesworth was in a room over in England. And the devil himself came into the room. He said it wasn't a demonic spirit. It was Satan himself. Saw him standing in the room. Woke him up in the middle of the night. And when he saw him, he just looked at him and said, Oh, it's you. And turned back over and went to sleep. He don't like to be treated that way. But you've got to understand something. Wigglesworth had documented, I think there was at least 19 cases. I may, be, I may misquote that, so don't hold me to that. But there were many uh, documented cases where he had raised people from the dead. I actually went into a, a parlor, a funeral parlor, like we go like a funeral home, stood a person up, drug them out, stood them up in a corner, and commanded them to breath to come back in them and to walk, and they did. Documented. pretty stout isn't it oh can i go back to the first part of the service he puts his britches on just like you do where did this authority come from who gets the glory for it why is it because how come we can condemn everything that comes against us how come how can we expect that no weapon formed against us you've never been promised that you won't have any weapon formed against you 
Jesus said in John 16, in the world you shall have tribulation. So you're not promised, you're not immune to attack or situations or circumstances. But you do have a promise that that weapon will not form or prosper. Not, not just form, but it won't prosper against you. Matter of fact, God said in, in Isaiah 54, he said, there, there's things that will gather against you. He said, but it's not me that's gathering against you. See, if God is for you, who can be against you? But there's things that will gather against you. But no, the truth, the truth is it won't prosper. It's not going to succeed. It's not going, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. I have, I have said this before, and you've heard me say this over the years here. I'm going to say it again. And I'm saying it because I want to say it, not only as, a, as an example, but because I believe it. And Jesus said, if you believe what you say will come to pass, you will have whatsoever you say. Now, let me tell you what I say. Because, see, what you say about you has everything to do with you. You can't say everything about me. There's people can say stuff about me, even if they try to curse me. They, they can't curse what God has blessed. See, I've been redeemed from the curse of the law that the blessing of Abraham is mine now through Jesus Christ. So I, I'm a blessed man. Not because of anything I've done, it's because of what he's done for me, and I've accepted that by faith. It's mine. But see, what I say about me matters. What somebody else says about me doesn't matter. It's like Paul. Here's a scripture the Lord gave. <laughs> oh, man. Did we overlook something earlier in our study of 1 Corinthians? Can I carry you back? I've got just a couple of minutes here. Can I carry you back to 1 Corinthians 4? Can I read you a scripture? You'll like this. Look at 1 Corinthians 4, 3. But with me. <laughs> That's the way you need, to, this, you need to talk like this. But with me. Or, or another way to say it. This is the way it is with me. Well, how is it with you? Well, let me tell you how it is with me. See, this is, this is the way Paul's talking about with him. Well, I'm just telling you, this is the way it is with me. See, I, I don't care what anybody else says about me. The only one I care what says about me is the Lord Jesus, is my Heavenly Father. Now listen, you, listen. Everybody wants to be accepted. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants people to appreciate them. But here, here's the thing about it. I'm not good today because you're good to me. I'm good today because he's good to me. I, I'm not, I'm not going to make it today or feel uh, more better about my life because you accept me, because I'm already accepted in the beloved. And he's the one who accepted me. Now listen, that doesn't mean we don't want to love people and, 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 and receive love from one another. But you have to settle these things in your heart. I've got scripture for this. Listen, I, I've had to go to the word of God. And I'm telling you, I've, had, I've went to this scripture. And I've went to this scripture recently, especially in our study. But there's been some things where I've had, I've went back to this scripture and I've looked at this scripture when nobody else was around but me and the Lord. Now let me give you what the scripture says. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. Let me, let me give you another way, another way to say that. It's really, it's really nothing to me of what, about what you think about me. I couldn't care less about what you think about me. Brother Roger, that doesn't sound good. Well, the reason it don't sound good is because we're so worldly-minded and we care about what others think. And we, uh, you have to be careful because if you're after the praises of men like the Pharisees was, you don't want to be in that class. And that's the problem. 
That's the problem with young people. That's a problem with people at the work at the marketplace because everybody's jockeying. Everybody's doing things that's not upboard and upright. There's no integrity. People's words is not their bond. They'll do anything and everything to try to put themselves in position, no matter what it does to other people. That's not that's not the Lord. Paul says it's a very, very, he, he, he could have said it's a small thing, but he used the word very. See, stuff like that jumps out to me. I mean, even the word very. It's a very small thing with me that you would judge me. Why? Because Paul says, I don't even judge myself. Why? Because I know the one who ultimately judges me. And in that day when everything will be made manifest, when everything will come to light, he's the one who will judge me. And before him, I will stand. So it really doesn't matter what you think. Let me go back to what I was saying that caused me to go into this scripture. Uh, it doesn't matter what you, say, what you say about me, but it does matter what I say about me. You know, it really doesn't matter what I say about you. What matters is what do you say about you. And what you need to say about you is what God says about you. Now, guys, I'm telling you, this is worth the price of admission today. I'm telling you right now, this, 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 this is, this, listen, this will beat your best deal regardless. But let me tell you what I say about me. And I've said this before, and I believe this when I say this. Roger's going to make it. Roger is going to make it. I'm going to make it. What do you mean going to make it? I'm going to make it. You know the old song, Don't You Worry About a Thing, or the Stevie Wonder song? Don't you worry about Listen, don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to make it. Why? Because I believe I'm going to make it. Why? Because he gave his life for me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live my life by the faith, his faith that he's put in me, but it's his faith. But that faith is the Amplified calls the word faith. I trust in I rely upon, I adhere to the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. you got to get that personal. Paul didn't use the word us. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he said, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's, like I said, there's not a respect of person, and it includes all of us. But see, Paul made it personal. You'll need to do things like this. You need to do it on purpose. Uh, I, I've told you this before. There's times I've crossed out one of the first uh, Bibles I had and I can go back and get that Bible out. When I was reading through my Bible and I got to Timothy. You know, the, the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy. And he said, my son, Timothy. I took, a, I took a marker and drew a line and scratched Timothy's name out. And I wrote my name above it. I did that on purpose in my own personal private Bible time. Why? Because I wanted it to be that personal. I didn't want, even though I knew he was saying things to Timothy, but I wanted, in my heart, I wanted to embrace that, that God is saying that to me. He loves us. He takes pleasure in us. We're not just his servants anymore. We're his sons and his daughters he takes pleasure in our prosperity. He desires above all things that we prosper and that we be in health. He don't want us injured. He don't want us stranded. He don't want any of that. Do we deal with some of those things at times? Yes. But do you know this? This is the victory that overcomes the world, First John 5, even our faith. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I am full of want. No, that ain't what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. I, I shall not want. Is he your shepherd? Absolutely he is. Acknowledge. He makes you to lie down in green pastures. He's not going to make you lie down where you got a bunch of rocks and metal sticking in your back. He's going to bring you. You're the sheep of his pasture. It's the Lord that has made you, not yourself. He brings you to places that supplies you. He's a shepherd. He takes care of you. And then all you have to do now is just speak his name. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run into it and they are safe. Amen. Stand to your feet. Praise the Lord. Thank you.